Genesis chapter 15. We're going to read here in just a second, but we're going to continue the, uh, the series, Faith, Dead or Alive. And so, a little bit of a different series. Normally when pastor is gone, I uh, try to work through a book. Uh, and so, we're not doing that now. We're going through this series of faith and what that looks like in our life practically. And the truth is, what we've, what we've seen so far out of James chapter 2 is this, that our faith is on display whether we like it or not. And uh, there's nothing we can do about that. And so it's showing one thing or another. It's going to show that we really live what we believe or we just say one thing, but we do another. And so a lot of people like to try to hide that. A lot of people would like to try to, uh, to have an outward display, especially uh, working with teenagers for 10 years. You see it a lot in youth groups. You see it a lot with young people. But the truth is it doesn't just stop at graduation. There's a lot of adults who like to put on a tie on Sunday morning. And, and on Sunday they live one way, but when Monday starts, their life looks a little bit different. And so we have to care about that. We have to, we have to be mindful that our faith is displaying what we say we believe. And so it does matter. And we go to Abraham because James goes to Abraham. In the next couple of verses there in chapter 2, he talks about Abraham's great faith. And the truth is, Abraham had a lot of faith, and he had great faith that was on display because God said this, I'm choosing you, Abraham, to be the father of many nations. I want to use your family, I want to use your seed, that one day all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And we know now, uh, looking back, that he's talking specifically about Jesus Christ. And Jesus was going to be from the line of Abraham. And, and that was God's plan from the very beginning, that the Hebrew people would be his people. The Jewish people would be the people that he chose from the time of Abraham on, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And truly, we are because of Jesus Christ. And so he called Abraham. And he said, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your kindred. I want you to go to a land that I've promised to you. And if you do these things, then I'm going to bless you. If you obey me, then I'm going, to, I'm going to give you more than you could even imagine. I'm going to do more through your family than what you could do yourself. And so Abraham leaves. Now, he doesn't make perfect decision. He takes a lot with him. Uh, but he does leave at that point, And he goes to the land that God promised. And if you remember the second message that we talked about, he went specifically where God asked him to be, and then a famine came. And it's just like that. When you, when you give your life to God and you start to live for him, we shouldn't be surprised when attacks come, when, when trials come, because the devil doesn't want us to experience the promises of God. He doesn't. And he didn't want Abraham to experience the promise of God. You see, if he could cut off the line of Abraham early, then that Messiah couldn't come. And so that's what, that was his goal. He tried everything he could to mess up the plan that God had set in place. And so a famine came. And instead of staying where they were supposed to be in the land that God promised them, and, and God said he'll take care of them and he'll provide for them in that land, instead of trusting him today, Abraham left and he went down to Egypt. He fled the famine and he tried to make it work on his own, in his own power, in his own way. And what we learn there is this, that the, the faith of yesterday cannot sustain the demands of today. And so just because Abraham had an experience or a moment of great faith, that faith cannot sustain the rest of his life. He's going to have to demonstrate faith over and over and over again in order to, to, to achieve the work that God wanted him to achieve, but also to experience the promise that God had for him. And so here where we pick up in Genesis chapter 15, we're a little bit away from that time in Egypt. You see, God had to get involved when they went down to Egypt. And God had some work that he had to do to make sure that his promise was going to be fulfilled. Because here's the thing. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And so even if Abraham messed up, God was going to get involved in such a way to make sure that his promise was true. And as long as Abraham were, were to obey, and as long as Abraham were to trust, then he could receive those blessings that come along with obedience to God. And so here we are in chapter 15, we're about 10 years later. So it's been 10 years since God made this promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. And it was, it's been 10 years that Abraham's been living in the land of Canaan, 
And here's where we pick up. After these things, the word of the Lord, verse 1 of chapter 15, came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. God comes to Abraham and he reminds him of the promise that he made. He said this, I'm here. You're not alone. Now you might be thinking, why would, he, why would God come back to him? Well, there were some events in between uh, these 10 years that have happened that God had to show himself mighty in Abraham's life, and he did. And so God comes here and he just wants to encourage Abraham a little bit more. He wants to, to remind him of the promise that he made. And he says this very specifically, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great re reward. He's saying this, I made a promise to you and I'm going to keep it. And there's going to be people who try to come in the way who are going to try to take that promise from you. But I'm your shield. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be here for you when you need me the most and I'm your exceeding great reward. I'll give you more than you could even imagine. I promise I'm going to do more for you than what you could even understand. And so Abraham just shows his heart a little bit in verse 2. He makes, it, he makes it very clear here in verse 2 that there's something on his heart and there's something on his mind. And Abraham said, and Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one board in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them, he said, unto, uh, he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Drop down to chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened unto the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when he saw, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. And Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thine hand. Do unto her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. We have a very interesting account here in the life of Abraham. And what we're going to see here is this, that when we try to accomplish the will of God in our way, we make a mess. See, God has a promise that he has given to Abraham. And he's going to fulfill that promise. But when Sarah got involved and when Abraham got involved to try to accomplish the will of God in their own way, it only caused issues. It only caused problems. Let's pray and we're going to get into this uh, message today. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time that we have here. God, I do pray that you'll use your word this morning to be an encouragement to us. God, I pray that you'll use your word to speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that if there's somebody who's here this morning who does not know you as their Savior, God, I pray that you'll please help them to realize their need. Lord, we thank you for the promises that your word gives us. Help us to trust you in your time. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in our passage, we've, we've already gone through the history. We've already gone through really the background of what Abraham has experienced here with God. And, and I want to take just a moment and I want to talk about this faith because Abraham has a lot of great faith here. 
He's in the hall of faith in, in Hebrews. He's, he's here uh, mentioned, uh, his name is synonymous with faith. Anytime you, you hear Abraham mentioned in the New Testament, faith is going to be uh, accompanied there. But Abraham had some hiccups on the road. And, and as he's living his life, he faced some things that, that he really didn't do the greatest job with. And this certainly is one of those stories. When, when, we, when we pick up in chapter 15, Abraham has just gone through some pretty, some pretty hard things in his life. And so God is reminding him that, that he's there with him, that he is, he's going to be there protect, to protect him. He's going to be there to, uh, to bless him because this is the promise that God made. Now, again, God gave a promise that was very specific to Abraham. We can't take the promise that God gave to Abraham and apply it to our lives because that was a promise that God gave specifically to him. But what we can do is take the Bible that is absolutely full of the promises of God and we can apply those to our life. We're going to talk about some of those here today and I'm excited to go through some of them because sometimes we have to be reminded that we have to do it his way. We can't do it our way. But Abraham decided that he was going to do it his way. And there's one factor that caused this to happen. You see, a beautiful thing happened in the first verse of chapter 15. God came to Abraham and reminded him of the promise. But in verse 2, Abraham shared his heart with God. You see, Abraham was wide open with God. There was something that was bothering him. There was something that was, that was frustrating him. And instead of just keeping it to himself and allowing it to fester, instead of just keeping it inside and allowing it to create issues in his life, he takes it to God. You see, in verse 1, when, he, when God said that he's the shield, Abraham just trained 318 of his servants to go and to rescue Lot, who was taken away captive. If you're here in Sunday school, we just learned about this a couple of weeks ago. There's a plug for Sunday school, 930 every Sunday. We get to hear these stories. We get to see how God works in the life of his people. And so that's exactly what happened. And honestly, 318 servants who were not soldiers were trained and used by God to defeat an army. And not just an army, but an army of armies. And God did a miracle. He did a great work. And he, he's working in the life of Abraham. And so where we pick up in chapter 15 is this, that God says, hey, I'm your shield. I'm going to be here to protect you. I have chosen you. I have chosen you to do this great work for me. And so I'm not going to let somebody get in the way. I'm not going to let something happen that's going to prevent this. If you obey me, I will fulfill the promise that I made to you. That's what he told him over and over and over again. And so he's reminding Abraham of this promise. And it's almost like Abraham just goes, I can't take it anymore. I got to let it out. You promised me that you're going to make me the father of many nations. You promised me that, that if I could count the sand on the seashore, that would be my generations. That would be the people in my lineage. You promised me that if I look up at the sky at night and I see the stars and I were to count the stars, that's how many people would be born through my family. That's how many people would be, would be in my family. And Abraham's sitting here and he says this, I don't have any children. Now when God made this promise, it was a special promise because he was 76 years old. God said this, I'm going to give you a child. And he told him that when he was 76. Do we have any 70-year-olds signing up to be a parent? <laughs> I don't think so. Probably not. But that's what he said. Not only that, it would have been a miracle in and of itself that he was able to have a child at 76. But not only that, Sarah was barren. She couldn't have children. So that even made this promise that much more special. It made it that much greater that 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 much more miraculous that God could do this because she was not able to have children. And so we talked about how they went down to Egypt. And you can imagine holding on to this promise in Egypt when they come back out of Egypt and when God intervened. And the days go by. God, I'm waiting. The years go by. God, I'm, I'm still waiting. You said you're going to give me a child. You said you're going to do something for me. And so I'm going to trust that you're going to do for me what you said you're going to do for me. But it's been 10 years and I still don't have a child. 
And so his mind begins to wander. And his, his mind begins to work just like our minds work. And he says this, you know, according to our culture, according to our customs, if somebody in my house has a child, they are an heir in my family. They are an heir, and I'm going to take care of them, and, and I'm going to provide for them just like I've provided for, the, for, for their parents and for their family. And so he says specifically by name, there's a young man who was born. Is he going to be the heir? I mean, it's been 10 years. And I, and I don't have a child of my own. Did you mean that whenever you gave me this promise that you were going to use somebody who was just born in my house? I mean, can you hear the, the thought that's gone into Abraham and Sarah's mind through their minds? Can you see how they're trying to connect some dots of how God could be working? They haven't heard anything for 10 years. They haven't had hope for 10 years. There's this child that's born, so he just says, I'm trying to connect some dots here. Is this what you meant? And God spoke to Abraham, and he said, no. The heir is going to come from your bowels. The heir is going to come from your seed. He's 86 years old now. Seriously? Really? And then we get to chapter 16, and it's 10 more years. He's 99 years old when they conceive and have a child. That's, excuse me, a couple chapters later. 99 years old. When that baby is born, he's 100 years old. I say all that to say this. He waited 24 years for God to do what he said he would do. That's a long time. That's a long time for somebody to receive a promise from God and have to wait. And along the way, what we see is this. Instead of patiently waiting for God to do what he said he would do, we have humans who do what humans do. Try to connect some dots. Try to make some things work. That's exactly what we see in verse 2. He says this, there's a child here. Is this the heir? I'll protect him. I, I believe truly that he was genuine in, in trying to protect that young person to be the heir that God wanted to use. But God said, no, I'm going to do it my way. And this child's going to come from your loins. Now, here's the thing. We have a little bit more of the promise revealed, right? At first, God says this, I'm going to make your seed. That is pretty broad, you know? He could, I could see how he could connect the dots to another heir in his, in his house according to the culture and customs of his land. I can see how he could get there, but God specifically says, no, your seed. And so with time, Abraham believes. If you see it, I think it's verse 6. And Abraham believed and God counted it to him for righteousness. That's a huge verse, a monumental verse, a verse that comes back up in the New Testament over and over again. Abraham believed God. And in spite of waiting for 10 years, he believed God. And he was going to have to wait a couple more. But in waiting, we see something else. We see Sarah, who starts to have the same struggles that Abraham had. Starts to have the same thought that Abraham had. She says this, God's not letting me have children. Abraham, it's been 10 years. Abram, it's been 10 years. God's not letting me have children. He's, he's withholding that from me. So he did say that this heir would come from your bowels. And what the people of the land do is if, if, the, if the wife can't have children, then they would marry the handmaid or they would have another wife and, and, and then that child could be raised from the mother, the, the wife of the patriarch, and then they can raise the, that child as an heir. Look, this was a normal custom in that time. Especially during the Bronze Age, uh, in that time period of human history, this is how their culture did it. If they couldn't have children, somebody would have a child for them, and then that would be their heir, and they would continue on that way. This happened all the time in the world around them. And here's the thing. This child would come from his bowels. 
So it checks all the boxes. You see, God said he's going to make a promise, and he said specifically that it had to come from your bowels, it had to come from you, and so as long as this child comes from you, then we can have another child, and then that child will be given to me, and then I can raise that child, and then now God's will can be accomplished, and we were able to make it happen. This is awesome. This is a great thing. Can you see what's happening here? She's trying to make things work. She's trying to make the promise of God fulfilled in her life, but she's doing it her way instead of his way. And the rest of this story is terrible. It's awful. Because what happens is he marries her. Now look, we're going to do this right. She's going to be your wife. He said it very specifically. He married her first. And God has plenty to say about that. But... We'll just look over that part because we got to get this done. So he married her so that there's no sin involved here. We're going to do this the right way. And she conceives, sure enough. And then something interesting happens. Sarah gets jealous because she's been trying for 80 years to have a child and she couldn't. She's been trying for a long time and she couldn't do it. And now Hagar comes onto the scene, and just like that. Well, hold on. Why are you upset, Sarah? Your plan worked. Well, what's the problem here? You had a plan that you set up, and it worked. What you wanted to happen actually happened. And then Sarah got mad. She got frustrated. Her life became more difficult. And then something very interesting happens. Hagar realizes that... You've been trying for how many years to have a baby? And now I do. And so now she's kind of looking down on Sarah. And this is a mess. This is not good. It gets pretty crazy pretty fast. And so now Sarah hates Hagar, and Hagar's looking down on Sarah. And now there's this really weird situation because when Abraham comes home and he says, Honey, I'm home, two women go, Hey. See, this is getting really interesting. It's getting really weird really fast. And now there's one that can have a child and one that can't. And there's a lot of awkwardness going on. And so Sarah goes to Abraham. Sarai goes to Abram. And she says this. I don't like her at all. She's treating me. Wrong. She's acting like she's the boss. And now I'm her lesser. And that's not the way this goes. It's not a good situation at all. And then we see some really poor character from Abraham. Number one, we saw really poor character from Abraham when he decided to go through with this. Shouldn't have done that in the first place. Should have been more of a man of God to trust God and his promise. But he went ahead and did this. He went ahead and tried to make this work even though he knew specifically what God meant. But he allowed it to just happen. We could take a minute here for just a second. I'm a husband. And the truth is, I've got a great wife. I've got a great family. But I'm going to tell you the truth. Honestly, sometimes I have the propensity to want to just go, fine. I just don't want to deal with it. Just go ahead. But if I do that as a man, that God has placed me in this position, you know what that's going to do? It's going to cause problems. If if I'm going to give up my responsibility that God has given me in my home, and I'm just going to roll over and just say, I just don't want to deal with it, so yeah, let's just make this work. Then that's just going to cause issues down the road. Now, that's not the message, but it fits. We got a lot of that in this passage. And so because of the decision he made, his family is now in this situation. And now Sarai comes to him and says, I don't like her. And instead of taking responsibility for his actions, he goes like this. Not my problem. Do with her what you want. Coward move. To not take responsibility for the actions that he put in place. Treat her how you want to. And she did. Sarah abused this handmaid. I can't even imagine what type of abuse could happen in that time, in that day, 
where that culture allows it. Here's what we do know. It was so bad that she ran away. She thought that she would have a better chance in the desert. She would rather risk her life and the life of her child in the desert than to stay with Abraham and Sarah. She was abused. This was not a good situation at all. And we could let the message lead down the path of the next several verses of how God came and saw Hagar in the desert and God cared for Hagar and God showed up for her and God worked in Hagar's life. But that's a Sunday school lesson here in a couple weeks, so make sure you're coming to Sunday school. We could go that direction. And I do, for just, I do want to for just a second because Hagar was going to have a child. It was going to be a son and she was going to name him Ishmael. And the angel said this, he's going to be a wild man. And he's going to be a father of many nations. And his descendants are the modern day Arabs today. And God did bless Ishmael. And God did bless his, his line and his family. But we're still dealing today with Arabs that hate Jews and that still fight right now. All because of a decision that Abraham and Sarah made. See, actions have consequences that are going to last a lot longer than we are. And so because of the decisions that he made, there's now a group of people that are constantly at odds with God's people. So we come back, we'll deal with Hagar in that Sunday school lesson here in a couple of weeks. But we come back to this, to this text. And here's what I want us to see in this text. This is what I believe God wants us to see in this text. That when we try to accomplish the promises and will of God in our life, our way, we will only make a mess. You see, this promise that God gave to Abraham was for Abraham. It was for him and his line. And God kept that promise. And we do, we do have uh, the Messiah that did come. And Jesus Christ was born. And God did what he said he would do. And now all the nations of the earth are blessed. But here's what we see. When they got involved and they tried to make it work themselves, they caused a lot of issues. They caused a lot of problems that we're still dealing with to this day. It's not a good situation at all. This is really a story that that is a stain on the life of Abraham. It's, it's not a good thing that happened here. And, and Abraham is here in this passage trying to work out what God said he would do. Now, I'm not going to harp on him too, too bad here because it doesn't take me very long to take a look at Abraham's life and then take a look at my life and see how many times I try to do the same thing. See how many times when God makes a promise to me and then I try to work it out. Why? Because it's taken too long. You see, God did fulfill the promise. Isaac was born, but it was 24 years later. That's a long time to wait. I don't like waiting. I like fast. I like quick. If I need to make a decision, I want to make a decision. I want it to happen really fast. I want to go through a drive through and get my food. I don't want to wait in line inside. Right? I like quick. When, when Walmart did the pickup order thing, thank you, Lord. I don't have to go in there to that battleground and walk around and try to fight through whatever and try to find what my wife wants me to pick up. Oh, I just pull into a spot, they bring it out, and I go home. It's awesome. I love it. I like quick. Decisions in my life, I want them to be made right now because I want what I want right now. I don't want to wait. But I'll tell you this, one thing I've learned since we moved to Springfield, one thing I've learned from our pastor is this, wait. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, when we first got here, it was like, we are waiting way too long. And he's like, it's been 10 minutes. I know, but let's just do it. Let's just make a decision. We got to go. Let's make this happen. We, uh, we went to Ohio to pick up this piano. And a couple of other things from my grandparents' church uh, that they're, they're closing the doors, unfortunately, too. But they, they donated a lot of stuff to our church. And so we're going to be able to use it in the new building and, and obviously now with this piano. And uh, so Pastor and I went there and we, we took this thing apart. 
And we had to lay it over on its side. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but pianos are heavy. <laughs> I know now. And uh, not fun to move. So uh, we took off as much as we could. We, we watched a YouTube video so we knew how to do it, of course. And uh, set up some pillows on the ground, laid it over, and then we take the legs off. So the legs are great. I was like, I got these. You get that. Walk out. <laughs> Get those legs out there, get everything ready to go. And then we had to flip this thing up and put it on wheels so that we could dolly it out. Because you're not like one, two, three, pick up. We're not doing one of those situations with the piano. So we get it on the dolly and we're going down the, the middle aisle of the church just like this to go out a double door in the back that goes straight outside. Now the problem is there's steps when you get outside that are not pleasant and fun. But then there's also like a threshold right there in the floor that has, you're, you're going to have to go up over it about five inches. So you're not like, let's push real hard and we'll just ramp it. That's not going to happen, okay? So we get all the way at the end and pastor goes, okay, let's get a game plan here. Let's, uh, let's think about how we're going to do this. And I was like, okay, this is great. So pastor's like, okay, if we move this here, we can situate and put the heavy part over here on my side. No. <laughs> And so we got all this stuff set up and everything's ready to go. And, and he goes, all right, I think I like it. This is a good plan. And then he goes, what are we going to do whenever we get to the second step? So we had the first step figured out, but then there was a second step and that was a, a doozy. And that one went down about that far. And so I was like, let's just wing it and see what happens. And he was like, it's hot. It's 100 degrees outside. This piano is heavy. I'm doing this and he's... Got the smoke coming out of his ears a little bit, having to deal with me, and rightfully so. I'm annoying. I get it. And so we're at the, at the end, and it's like, all right, here we go. First part works perfectly, exactly like he laid it out. This is great. Second part, we did it my way. Just go. See what happens. Here we go. Pick it up. Yeah, trying to go. By some miracle, we get it down the step and into the... U-Haul. And then we sit down to take a break. And then we realize, fast was not a good idea. Because now my back hurts really bad. <laughs> and at one point, I'm pretty sure my finger was under something and the piano fell down. And I'm like, that hurts. And it hurts my back to lift my arm to look at my finger. Not a good situation. But here's what I realized. Me trying to just go fast, make it happen, just get it in there. Yeah, I got in there, but now there's some consequences for the actions of just making it happen. And I promise you, until about two days ago, it was still sore. I was still dealing with the issues of trying to haul a piano the fast way. What I'm learning more and more is this. It's better to wait. And if I'm just going to plow through and just make it happen, yeah, it's going to happen. It might happen. But there's going to be some serious consequences that come along with that happening. There's going to be some pain. We had a nine-hour drive the next day. That was not a pleasant drive home. Oh, stop hitting bumps. <laughs> not fun. And I had to deal with the consequences of that action. And here's the thing. As humans, we don't like to wait. But it feels like God does. And waiting 25 years for him to fulfill this promise in Abraham's life is a long time to wait to have a child, especially when the biological clock is ticking, especially when logic and reason says, I better do something or else, especially when the culture around says, just do it this way. This is how we all do it. It's okay. Nobody's going to look down on you. Maybe that's what God wanted you to do is just try it this way and then you'll get what you wanted. You'll get what you need. Just, just make it happen. But what God's saying is this, wait. I had a revelation in thinking about this. For me, it's waiting a long time. But doesn't God say something about a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day? For God, 25 years is less than that. He can do a lot of time, a lot of work in just a snap of the finger. He can do what he wants to do, but here's the thing. He's going to do it in his time. And what Abraham needed to do, what Abram needed to do, and what Sarai needed to do is this. 
trust God. They needed to wait. They needed to do it God's way. And when they tried to get involved and when they tried to do it their way, the only thing that happened is they made a mess. That's it. And not only did they make a mess, you have an Egyptian non-believer who now experienced the only experience of God that they could have by people who just made a mess of God's name. That's not a great testimony at all. Now, God got, he, he got involved and he took care of that. But it's not a good situation. And when I think about my life, when we think about the promises that God has for us, there's two ways that those promises can happen. Number one, we can wait on him. We can do it his way. Or we can try to make it work our way. We can try to use our logic or our reasoning or even the culture of the world around us to try to make it make sense or try to accomplish the will of God in our life. And I'm here to tell you, if you do that, it's a mess. If you try to be a spouse the world's way, you're going to make a mess. See, God promised that he can help you be the husband that you're supposed to be. He can help you be the wife that you're supposed to be. God promised that if you do it his way, you can have a successful marriage. You can have a successful union. But so many times we use our logic or our reasoning or even the culture around us to say, well, this is how we do it in America. This is how we do it in Springfield, Missouri, or this is how we do it uh, in, in, from my point of view. I think that if I treat her this way, then this is going to work out. I'm just telling you that if you're trying to accomplish the promise of God of having a good marriage, and you're trying to accomplish that your way, you're going to make a mess. It's not going to work. If you're trying to work it out with your reason and your logic, it's not going to go the way you want it to go. It's just going to lead to hurt. It's just going to lead to frustration. It's just going to lead to pain. But if you do it God's way, it works. It might take some time, but it works. Teenagers, I'm going to preach to you for a minute. Because the world you're stepping into every day, as you're a teenager, you're taking more and more steps into this world. The world has a lot of things that it wants to promise you. And while I know that you, you believe what God's word says, the world says, well, yeah, you can have that. But just try it this way. The world says, yeah, you can have a good life like God promised. But if you do it this way, then it's going to work out. Or if you use reason or logic to try to make decisions for, for your life going forward and what you think the world looks like and what you think the world's going to be for you, if you use your reason and your logic, here's what's going to happen. You're going to make a mess. I believe all of us would say, yes, I agree with what God's word says about being a husband or a wife. Of course. Yes, I believe what God's word says about being a young person and how I ought to act and how I ought to behave and how I, should, how I should live my life. Of course I believe that. But we can say that we believe these things all day long, but the proof is in our actions. You see, our faith is on display. We can say one thing, but if we're doing another, we're just going to make a mess. It's not going to go the way we want it to go. Being a parent is difficult, and the world has a lot to say about being a parent. The world has a lot to say about what you should and shouldn't do, how you should and shouldn't treat your kids, how you should raise them with this mindset or with that mindset, and how you should put these things in their, in their mind and, and raise them this way or that way. The world has a lot to say about it. There's a lot of books. There's a lot of talk shows. There's a lot of TV that have advice for you. But God made a promise that if you raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it will work. If you do it his way, if you discipline his way, if you treat them the way that God wants you to treat them, it will work. It takes time. And if you're patient and you're consistent, it will work. But so many times we don't want to wait. So many times we would rather use our logic or our reasoning or, or the culture around us to say, well, I'm going to try this and see what happens. Well, this makes sense, really, if you think about it. It really does connect some dots that sound really good. It's going to be a mess. Because the promise of God cannot be accomplished by us getting involved with our reason and logic. It just doesn't work that way. Wait on Him. 
Do it his way. And he'll fulfill his promise every single time. We could go through what it means to be a worker, what it means to be a neighbor, what it means to be a church member, what it means to be whatever it is. God's word is full of resources. It's full of instruction of how he promised that he would work in our life. But we have to do it his way. Here's the encouragement. Don't rush into doing it your way and making it happen your way or with your reason or with your logic. Because all that's going to happen is you're going to make a mess. And not only is it going to affect your family, but it's going to affect people that don't believe around you. The life we live matters. I'm, I'm convinced of the old saying that the only Jesus people might be see is in the way you live your life in the community around you. They might not ever open a Bible and read it, but they see you every single day. I pray that they see Jesus and not us connecting dots, trying to work out promises that God made in our own power and our own strength. One leads to a mess. One leads to (coughs) blessing. Let's just live the way he asked us to live. Let's just be who he's asked us to be. And let's just trust him, not only in word, but in action. Don't let your faith be dead. Don't let your faith be dead. Let it be real. Let it be alive. Let's live out what we say we believe. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. I do pray that you'll help us, God, to realize that your way is the only way. God, I do pray that if there's somebody who's here today that doesn't know, doesn't know you as their Savior, they know that, that they've done wrong. They know that they're sinners. But, Lord, they, they've never asked you to be their Savior. They've never... They've never asked and put their faith and trust in you. God, I pray that you'll help them to realize the greatest promise that you ever made was that we could have a relationship with you. And God, I pray that you'll help them to realize that there's only one way that that's going to work, and that's if we do it your way. We cannot accomplish a relationship with you in our own power. There's a lot of beliefs out there that if I'm just a good person or if I'm, if I'm just a, a, a giving person, then God's going to accept me. But that's not how it works. It might make sense logically or, or in our minds. We might be able to connect some dots. But God, I pray that you help these, these folks, that if they don't know you, to realize that the greatest promise is only accomplished by doing it your way, by obedience to what you say. God, I'm thankful that your word is clear, that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, God, I pray that if there's somebody who's here today who does not know you as their Savior, God, I pray that you'll help them to accept the greatest promise that you've ever given and a relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us in this time of invitation. God, I pray that you'll do what only you can do in our lives. Help us to be an example of faith for you. Be with us in this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed.